Where are the two teachers? Welcome to Room to Be. Now it's time to get schooled. We're talking about foundations, the foundations of American government and politics. Today's lesson, we're looking at how this new constitution impacted the strength of the central government. Andy, when ratified, the constitution was meant to be a safeguard of our individual liberty. We feared a strong, tyrannical government. But when you look at American history, it's really the story of the federal aggrandizement of the central government. Today, let's look at how that exactly happened. Well, some people say the Constitution was a counter-revolutionary document because the Declaration of Independence in the Revolutionary War was this war and this action against abusive central government. Then, when we created this Constitution, we purposely created a government with a stronger central government although we said we were going to try to limit its powers. We needed a stronger central government at the time, but not too strong. And we're still debating whether or not it's become too strong. Well, what provisions in the Constitution have been used to expand the power of the central government? One is the Elastic Clause. Of course, the Elastic Clause is the necessary and proper clause that empowers the Congress to go beyond what the enumerated powers suggest. The framers understood that they did not have a prescient view of the future, and if some new concern were to arise, the Congress is empowered when it's necessary and proper to address that concern. And sometimes that elastic clause is referred to as the implied powers. But that implied power of the elastic clause always must connect to one of the enumerated powers of Article I, and those enumerated powers are where the Constitution specifically lists what Congress can do. Congress can declare war. Congress can coin money. Congress can pay for armies and navies. But the enumerated power that's been used most often to expand central government power, especially in economic areas, is Clause 3, the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause has been used more than any other to expand the role of the central government. But Andy, also contained in the original Constitution is that provision we know as the Supremacy Clause. The framers understood that there would be disputes between the national, state, and local governments. Written into the document is a clearly articulated solution. In the end, the national government is supreme. We fought a civil war over this, and we continue to fight similar battles over that tension between central, state, and local government. And you can especially see that tension evident in U.S. political history and Supreme Court cases, like McCulloch versus Maryland, where we have at the heart of that case the Supremacy Clause and the Commerce Clause, this question about whether Congress had the power to create a national bank and whether the state of Maryland had the power to tax that national bank. The Supremacy Clause, according to the Supreme Court in McCulloch versus Maryland, said that Maryland could not tax the national government but that even though the words national bank weren't specifically in the Constitution, the elasticity of the Commerce Clause allowed Congress to create this national bank. Another important Supreme Court case that we just have to acknowledge in this tension is Marbury versus Madison. In 1803, the issue is, what is the exact power of the Supreme Court to rule on acts of Congress? Well, the court in Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. Judicial review established the power of the courts to rule on the constitutionality of law. The Supreme Court can strike down an act of Congress or an act of the president as unconstitution, unconstitutional. Clearly, this expanded the role of the United States Supreme Court. But Andy, as much as this history looks like we've expanded the role of the central government without a check, let's not forget, contained in the original Constitution are three critical safeguards of our individual liberty. And one of them is that Congress and the federal government cannot pass a bill of attainder. A bill of attainder is some kind of punishment that a law would give you without a trial. And those are illegal. The only way the government can punish you is through a judicial process, not through a bill of attainder. Nor can we be denied our writ of habeas corpus. Andy, the government cannot detain us without telling us why. We must always be uh, given a reason for being held in custody. The government is also prohibited from passing ex post facto laws, laws that punish you for something 
that was legal at the time. The only way the government can punishes you, punish you is by passing a law and then punishing the illegal activity that happens after that law is passed. We've been looking at that critical issue that was there from the very beginning in 1787. How do you make a central government stronger without making it too strong? That question we're still debating and analyzing even today. We're the two teachers, and you've been schooled in room to be. Where there's always room to be an informed citizen.